Again, I ask, what is going on with our elected leaders? First, we've got Tootie, I'm inviting the whole town to Thanksgiving Smith, taking over the Clackamas County Board. For the record, <clears throat> I never said that COVID was a hoax. Now, one of her fellow commissioners is getting some heat after someone dug up an Islamophobic Facebook post he made. And we're trying to track down this Oregon State rep who just got in a bunch of trouble for letting violent rioters into the Capitol. Hi, this is Dan Haggerty from KGW News. I'm trying to get in touch with Representative Mike Neerman. Plus, Oregon's vaccine plan takes a baby step forward and puts a new group on the schedule to get a shot. Wait, there's a schedule, you ask? I said a baby step. Here's the story. Oh, and I spoke too soon because the baby's growing up and we have big news to start the six o'clock hour and the story for you tonight. We usually don't have breaking news on this show, but let's do it tonight. Roll the stinger. We don't have a stinger. Let's get right to the tweet. Governor Kate Brown just sending this out moments ago announcing, listen to this, Oregonians 65 and older will be able to get the COVID vaccine starting January 23rd. And that is humongous news. What a big development. Not only that, but so will teachers and child care providers. This is huge and it is a major change from the governor's original plan. You'll remember if you watched this last night, we were talking to seniors, people who were upset that teachers kind of skipped them to get to the front of the line. Now all of them are going to be getting the vaccine at the same time. Obviously, the state has reconsidered the way it was planning this rollout. Uh, we don't know what has changed. Again, uh, we just got this news via tweet from the governor, so we don't have a ton of details beyond the basics that we're sharing with you right now. I definitely want to hear what you're thinking. So if you have an opportunity and you want to send us a tweet, use that hashtag HeyDan. If you want to tell us what you're thinking, send me an email at the story at KGW.com. The governor tonight is urging, we can tell you this, telling people don't start you know, going and calling your doctor right away. Be patient. The, the, the plan is going to be kind of spelled out, she said, as, as they kind of get their ducks in a row. Uh, she said newly eligible people should not call their doctor's office right away. We got, as you should probably know from where we stand, when we get news like this just a few minutes before a newscast, Everybody gets to work. Uh, our, my, my boss is calling everybody that they can. We have our vaccine team working right now to get as much inf information as quickly as we can for you on this because I know a lot of people sat up in their seats when I told you that people 65 and older along with teachers and people who work with kids are going to be getting this vaccine by the end of this month or at least starting to get it by the end of this month. Uh, again, we have more vaccine news a little later in the show. We're going to circle back to it, but at this point, let's get to the big story. Whew, I'm almost out of breath and I still got a lot of talking to do, especially with this big story, because we're talking about a lot of the people who we voted into public office who are causing some trouble and not good trouble either. As the late John Lewis put it, we're talking about the kind of stuff that puts public health and safety at risk or is just downright racist. More on that part in just a minute. First, let's check in with one of our favorite subjects here on this show, and that's Tootie Smith. You remember her. She's the new Clackamas County Board of Commissioners chair who made headlines after announcing that she would defy the governor's COVID restrictions and instead celebrate Thanksgiving with, quote, as many family and friends as I can find. Then she went on Tucker Carlson's show and said this. We do not need to be treated as second-rate slaves in our own homes. Yee. Uh, now, the next time we heard from her was New Year's Day when she showed up at a big rally at the state capitol against COVID restrictions. But she never really answered any of our specific questions, even though we asked many, many times. My question being now, What's up with Tootie Smith? What is she doing nowadays? Well, she was just sworn into her new position and she presided over her very first board meeting last week. Let's take a look at how that went. For the record, <clears throat> I never said that COVID was a hoax. I do consider it to be quite serious. As you can see, I wear a mask. Yet your new chair, Tootie Smith, has been outspoken in her opposition to common sense measures. Uh, I'm sorry this person chose to disrepresent and spread misinformation about my positions. At that rally, you identified yourself as the chair of Clackamas County Commission and therefore assume you were there in an official capacity. Now, I want to thank Ms. Burke for spreading more disinformation and lies. Oof, coming right out of the blocks. So obviously, uh, a lot of her constituents aren't really happy with her, and she doesn't seem too happy about being called out by them. And one of her fellow commissioners, I guess, empathized a little, Mark Schultz, because he came to her defense. My observation of Chair Smith is that she is truly concerned about every single citizen in this county. I think 
those of you who might have some concerns right now, I think in the next few weeks, you're going to be much more uh, relaxed and, and assured that the Board of Commissioners is on the right track. Let's all just relax. And it, you know, it is interesting, though, that you would come swooping in like that, Commissioner Shaw. And if you were hoping to deflect some of that negative attention from Tootie Smith, you succeeded because uh, it looks like there's now a new problem with the Board of Commissioners and it involves you because one of your constituents dug up some pretty racist and Islamophobic Facebook posts. And now Muslim community leaders want you to resign. Let's have Tim Gordon break it down for us. This is Mark Scholl and a picture from his campaign website. The Iraq War veteran is a brand new Clackamas County Commissioner. His Facebook page is shut down now, but not before the inflammatory posts were saved last week. A person who lives in Clackamas County with ties to the local Democratic Party compiled them. Chris Waller says she made it her personal mission to investigate concerns she had about Scholl. And so I checked and he did. And I immediately was aghast at what I saw. What Waller saw were many Islamophobic statements, including Islam is in total conflict with America, with the Constitution and with the Christian values upon which the USA was founded. And when you interact with a Muslim, you're being deceived, period, end of sentence. Scholl also takes on immigrants and the Black Lives Matter movement, too. Writing, BLM is not about black lives mattering or any other life mattering. BLM is a pawn for the rise of neo-Marxism. When you say you were astonished when you saw it all, in what way were you astonished? That anybody who is a public official could put forth these types of views. You mentioned teachers are in phase 1B. Today, the only camera Scholl would go in front of was the one at a board of commissioners meeting. He did release a statement saying in part, I apologize for any concerns in the community related to my comments years ago about problems with integration of Islam into Western society. I respect the freedom of religion that extends to members of the Islamic community as well as to all religious beliefs. It's important to note that the offensive posts you see here are not from years ago, but from the past couple of years, including from 2020. I'm shocked. I'm disappointed. Um, just reading through those comments, it's hard to get through. It is very triggering. It is very hateful and bigoted. The Council on American Islamic Relations in Oregon has seen enough. Sahar Muranovich says words have consequences, especially in these troubling times. Have, we absolutely think he needs to resign. Um, if he doesn't resign, um, the other commissioners need to take some sort of action. Okay, Tim Gordon joining us now. Tim, quick question. There was supposed to be a roundtable with the commissioners tonight to discuss these Facebook posts. Did that happen? No, it did not happen, Dan. Tootie Smith, the chair, uh, she canceled it so that she could work on a statement. She's come out with one now, and it says in part, I want to assure residents that I in no way condone or agree with these offensive statements. They do not reflect my values. Such statements are an attack on human dignity and have no place in government. Our role as commissioners is to serve residents, build trust, and create a safe and private community for all residents. Bigoted statements by elected officials undermine that work and trust. Okay. Uh, she did stop short of calling on him to resign. Is, is anybody calling on him to give up his seat? Yeah, she did. And we haven't heard from any of the Clackamas County commissioners publicly on that issue of resignation for Shoal. But we have heard from a Multnomah County commissioner, Sushila Jayapal, is calling for Shoal's re uh, resignation. She says uh, she describes Shoal's rhetoric as racist, Islamophobic, anti-immigrant, and homophobic as well. And she wants him to resign immediately. Right. Dan, back to you. Yeah, Tim Gordon, I know you'll keep following this story for us. Let us know what happens. You bet. Now, let's turn to Oregon, the Oregon lawmaker redefining the term open door policy. Representative Mike Nearman is facing charges, a fine, and calls to resign from the House Speaker after the Republican state rep was caught on video, this video, opening the Capitol doors to right-wing demonstrators trying to bust into the building. It took a swarm of state troopers to push them out. It was a violent day that ended with people kicking in doors and assaulting an officer with bear mace. Nearman hasn't returned any of our calls, but he did call in to conservative talk radio, ho uh, radio show host Lars Larson. Now, keep in mind, Nearman said his lawyers told him not to talk about the events of that day, but said he's not going to resign. In fact, 
He says the House Speaker is the one who should resign. Interesting pivot, I know. Here's how he explained it to Lars. This is all political, and I have to tell you, you know, I just sat through a mandatory training on workplace safety and, and harassment and all this kind of stuff, and what she did was pure politics. What she did was she had video that she sat on for 16 days, 16 days, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware for that I'm under investigation, although I read that in the media. But if I'm under investigation and she releases that video, that imperils my ability to get a fair trial on that. Oh, okay. I, what? But you're the one in the video. You're the one who opened the door. Representative, Representative Nierman, I, I get it. I, I agree with you. Speaker Kotek probably should have released it earlier. And by it, I mean the video of you opening the door for angry demonstrators trying to break into the Capitol. By the way, just so everybody at home and so you know, we got the video not from Kotek, but through filing a public records request. We didn't get that from her. But again, what does any of that have to do with this? Of course, he couldn't say because he's lawyered up and is worried about a fair trial. Although it does seem the jury is out in his hometown of Independence, at least according to an actual press release we got from the city. You see, the media keeps referring to Nierman as the lawmaker from Independence, and apparently they don't like the bad press. The release says, in part, in the wake of recent events at the state capitol, there appears to be confusion among members of the media and the public about which legislature, legislator actually serves as the Oregon House representative of the community of Independence, Oregon. Rep. Mike Nierman is not the elected state representative for Independence. Rep. Nierman lives in rural Polk County and receives his mail through the Independence Post Office, hence the Independence Address. He does not live in the city. Now, just for reference, let's go ahead and zoom in on Independence there a little closer. Take a look at the district lines. The map doesn't lie. Independence is represented, represented by Democrat Paul Evans, not Mike Nierman. Now, for now, I have an open invite for Rep. Nierman to chat with me about all of this, though I'm not really hopeful that's going to happen. Though I will say his schedule just cleared up a bit as he was booted from both of his legislative committees. Now. Let's check back in with what you really care about, all right? At least according to the emails that we be getting, and that's the vaccine. Again, if you missed it off the top, we just learned that Oregonians 65 and older, older will be able to get the shot starting January 23rd, which is a massive development and one a lot of people have been waiting on. Considering some healthcare workers really at this point in Group 1A still didn't even know when they were going to get the vaccine until earlier today. Kristen Severance joins us now with answers. Yes, Dan, actual answers instead of the non answers that we've been getting from the state when we asked about this and really anything vaccine related. So we were contacted by healthcare workers like Kate, who said, I am a healthcare volunteer in the phase 1A group 4. I'm retired and not affiliated or family or friend of any large healthcare system. She goes on to say, I keep seeing people on TV getting vaccinated, and I look at all the information on the OHA webpage, but I can't find any way to sign up or line up for a vaccine. Thank you, Kate, for writing in. Well, today we were able to help Kate and a lot of other people looking for that answer. Oregon is well behind pace in administering COVID vaccines. State officials originally set a goal of 100,000 doses given by the end of December. Instead, we just crossed the 100,000 mark nearly two weeks late. To speed things up, OHA got rid of the tiered approach and opened up the 1A group to all healthcare workers. The problem, healthcare workers who were not part of a major health system still had no idea how to get a vaccine. Private doctors, physical therapists and volunteers contacted KGW about the lack of plan and guidance. I know it's been the holidays. I know OHA is stretched thin, but they have known this is coming. And um, people are dying every day and contracting this virus. Susan Weedle is a pelvic physical therapist. She must see patients in person. She was shocked by the lack of answers. I mean, how do you feel knowing that there are a lot of other people in the same boat as you? Um, yeah, it's frustrating. It's a very large group and I'm really concerned that there's no way to contact us directly. So it seems to be up to us to just continue to call and ask on a daily basis to just 
see what our options are for ourselves and our patients. Retired nurse Kate Wood has been volunteering for the state at COVID so testing sites. She's also lost. We volunteers were basically told, you know, go find your own vaccine. You're eligible because we're considered public health workers, but they didn't offer us any help about how to sign up. Washington, Multnomah, Clackamas and Columbia counties joined with the largest hospital systems to speed up the process. Basically, healthcare workers will fill out a short survey requesting the vaccine. If you work for a practice, one person will fill out the survey for the group. If you're solo, you'll fill it out on your own. Public health departments will go through these surveys, verify if you should get a vaccine, and then tell you which hospital to go to. I think we've made a more inclusive, open, transparent pathway that we've stood up over the last few days to go ahead and help make sure that, that folks in phase 1A are covered. But for now, a small sense of relief for so many in that 1A group. Matt, how does it feel knowing that, okay, there is a plan for people like you? Well, I'm, I'm happy about that because I know being retired and not having anybody dependent on me, I could do more. I would be able to do more. Again, thank you to Kristen for that piece. And I want to tell you, we don't know, to specify a, a little bit further, we don't know where people 65 or older will fit into the plan as we have it right now. If they have to use the same survey as those workers in 1A or how they will sign up to get this vaccine, we still have a lot of questions. And I know you do too. We're going to do the best we can to keep answering them. We're going to have some more information at 630. Pat Doris is on it, so we're going to have a report filed then. So stay with us after the story. Meanwhile, Portland's mayor is about to start union negotiations with police, and there's something specific he wants to get rid of. The embarrassment clause needs to go away. The embarrassment clause is ridiculous on its face. Don't be embarrassed if you don't know what the embarrassment clause is or what it actually means. We're going to talk about it, and some say it's actually a big barrier to police accountability. We'll get into that when the story continues. Welcome back. Sorry, commercials are over. They can be fun, but you got to look up from your phone now. I'm just kidding. Keep scrolling while you're watching the show. Leave us a comment on my Facebook page while you're at it. Now, in the meantime, we want to talk about policing in Portland and a big, important process that starts tomorrow. Now, it's something a lot more people are going to be paying attention to than they typically do, considering, oh, I don't know, the entire year of 2020. You see, after George Floyd's death, amid all the protests and all the calls for change, there was a consistent, tangible conversation around police unions. The unions that represent rank and file officers across the country. Now, those unions are powerful and the contracts they reach with their respective cities are they often play huge key roles in deciding how officers are hired, how they're trained, how they're disciplined, how they're fired, literally you name it. Now, a lot of critics have said that these contracts were the reason or at least one of a few reasons that officers who behaved badly on the job got to keep their jobs. Well, amid all of that unrest last year, Portland's police union contract was actually supposed to be renegotiated and renewed. It was supposed to happen over the summer, the summer of 2020. So no surprise, the city and the union, they kind of looked around and looked at each other and said, maybe we postpone this for a little bit, which they did. And now those negotiations will start again tomorrow. Our Maggie Vespa has spent days digging into what this could look like, and we have a big story around it to air for you tomorrow. That said, I sat down with her a little earlier today to give us a preview. Okay, Maggie Vespa joining us now. So, Maggie, negotiations between the Portland Police Association and the city start tomorrow, and we're going to be focusing on the priorities that both sides kind of have going to the table. What would you say those are right now? So for the city, uh, it pretty much aligns with what some activists, at least to some degree, it aligns with what some activists want, which is more transparency when it comes to officers who are disciplined and frankly, more public input in that process as well. Um, the heads of the Portland Police Association, the heads of the union say that there's already enough public transparency, enough public input in those processes. And they worry that to pull back the veil um, on discipline more, and especially IDing officers who just commit uh, basically minor mistakes on the job, would put the officer's safety at risk. And they also have a lot of concerns about the dozens of vacancies, and we've covered this within the Bureau, and frankly, that the city, a lot of people worry, doesn't have enough police officers, and they say that you know, obviously makes Portland, in their minds, less safe, and they worry this will continue to exacerbate that problem um, if the veil is kind of lifted more on, on discipline. 
Now, I know you just mentioned how you've covered this in the past, and also I know you've been talking to a lot of sources about this specific negotiation. And and in this case, both uh, Portland's mayor, Ted Wheeler, who will be helping in the negotiating, uh, negotiating side for the city, as well as the Portland Police Association president, they have some concerns, I guess, over this embarrassment clause. Can you can you explain what that is? Yeah, we've covered the quote unquote embarrassment clause before. I'll show it to you now. It's Article 20.2 in the current PPA contract, and it states, quote, if the city has reason to reprimand or discipline an officer, it shall be done in a manner that is least likely to embarrass the officer before other officers or the public. And the director of the Independent Police Review in Portland, which is an independent agency that investigates allegations of officer misconduct, that director told me point blank, that clause is a huge hurdle that often, he says, keeps instances of discipline against officers from being known to the public. It keeps them private. Um, So it's why we basically, he says, or one reason why we don't hear about discipline in most cases. So first, you're going to hear what Mayor Ted Wheeler has to say about the embarrassment clause. And as you'll hear, he was pretty blunt. The embarrassment clause needs to go away. The embarrassment clause is ridiculous on its face. When when you uh, discipline somebody, it is inherently embarrassing. That's just the way it is. And so I, don't, I honestly don't know how that embarrassment clause ever made it into a contract, but it should go away. Okay. And then in contrast, here's a portion of an exchange I had with the new president of the Portland Police Association, Brian Hunziker, and a police association spokeswoman, Angela Orr, who was also on that call. And just to sum up, they do want that clause to remain. It will never be my job to publicly shame put someone in a spotlight that might affect their family or their livelihood in a negative way. I won't do it for a police officer. I wouldn't do it for a teacher. I wouldn't do it for a doctor. I'm not going it, to, it's just not, it's just not the right thing to do. Can I make one quick statement? Um, yes. I think that the idea that um, in the police contract, there's a special um, clause where police aren't supposed to be embarrassed. That same sentiment is in, I believe it's in every city public employee contract. Something with very similar wording. So it isn't a special protection for police officers. It's a protection for um, unionized workers. And I think- sure. One might argue, a layman might argue it's tough to see the merit in comparing police officers and the mistakes they make and the impacts they have given the nature of their job to teachers or to city employees who work Mm -hmm. with say PBOT or something. Yeah. Well, keep in mind that that deals with, um, there's, there's no reason to put on display, uh, anyone, right? I mean, so Dan, at least on that specific point, there definitely, it seems going, into this process at odds with each other. And from what we can tell, the same can be said um, regarding their takes on a recent voter approved measure that promised to give Portlanders more control over discipline of officers and more again, transparency in that process. The union is fighting that as well. So again, these negotiations begin tomorrow and we'll have much more on this tomorrow night here on The Story. Sounds good. Maggie, thank you. Police accountability has been a huge topic over the past year, especially in Portland. So how did we get here? Well, after Minneapolis police killed George Floyd last spring, those protests erupted around the country and thousands of people marched in the streets of Portland, many calling to defund the police and city leaders listened. In June, the Portland City Council cut $15 million from the Portland Police Bureau's budget. It was a lot of money, but it wasn't enough for activists who wanted $50 million cut. In the fall, Commissioner Joanne Hardesty proposed another, more controversial cut that would slash an additional $18 million from the police budget. It eventually failed, with new Commissioner Dan Ryan casting the swing no vote. But this is about more than budget cuts. Last summer, the Portland City Council extended the police union contract for one year. Disrupted by the pandemic and mass protests, negotiations would have gone into private mediation, completely out of the public view. Then, on Election Day, Portland voters overwhelmingly passed a new police oversight measure, allowing the city to create an independent oversight board with the power to discipline or even fire police officers. 
Portland's police union came out strongly against it. It even filed a grievance with the city after the election, despite the measure passing with 80% of the vote. They said the union was left out of the negotiations against state law. To avoid a big legal battle, the city is hoping now that the state legislature will pass a bill this session that would let them create this new oversight board without negotiating terms with the union. And that's how we got here. And we've gotten about to about the end of the show. So if you got something to say, let me hear it now. Police reform is a huge topic, but I'm sure you're probably thinking about that vaccine news. Either or, use the hashtag HeyDan. We'll read some comments and finish this thing up after this. I'm being told we're out of time, as in like we have been out of time now for a couple of minutes. So uh, big show today. We had a lot of topics to talk about, a lot of big. It was kind of one of those days where every single topic could have been the first topic in, in the show. But I think none of them beat that news, that breaking news off the top that people 65 and older, along with teachers and, uh, day, and people working with children are going to be getting that vaccine by the end of this month or at least start to. So uh, keep those questions coming. Keep using the hashtag. Hey, Dan, we got the news at 630 coming up next. If I were you, I'd stick around for it. Laurel Porter's got all the interesting interesting news to tell you. See you tomorrow.